How times have changed, though. Uh, if we had this presentation two years ago, we could have done it in this closet out here. But uh, you know, <laughs> things have been changing. Things have been changing locally quite a bit. So, uh, so I'm Brian Eaton. I'm the chair of the Solar Time Conceit Smart Board of Directors, and. Uh, you know, I, we've had more than 50 public meetings in the last two years in the county, and uh, 20 tours of installed systems. And also, uh, some of you may remember from two to three years ago that uh, Bryce Smith and Melissa Kemp and uh, Kate Nicholson and I did this road tour of about 10 venues uh, on the building and heating with the climate in mind. Uh, you know, and we had the last one was at the Hotel Ithaca, it was specifically designed for architects and engineers. So, so subsequently, we've had a great increase in uh, large commercial projects uh, committing themselves to installing solar heat pumps. Hundred, hundreds of units of housing will soon be using heat pumps to generate heat and cooling. So, but however, many architects and engineers uh, are not fully yet fully comfortable with uh, recommending these systems to their clients. There are questions on costs and incentives. What are reliable estimates for coefficients of performance for various brands of air source and ground source heat pumps? In our region, can a cold climate air source heat pump be relied upon for building heating without supplemental electric resistance heating? How rapidly does the CO heat drop for air source heat pumps as the temperature declines below 5 degrees? Can ground source heat pumps be deployed in congested urban areas? Are there New York State incentives for air source heat pumps? I have found that there is widely divergent opinion on these issues. Hopefully we'll emerge from this uh, discussion more well informed, have more of a common sense uh, of, of these technologies and their costs and capabilities. And uh, one of our speakers, Bruce, and our program director, Jonathan, just presented at the Northeast efficiency partners meeting uh, this week in Boston so they may have the most recent information so anyway our format today is presenters will present for about 20 minutes each 10 minutes of questions and answers if needed and then after three all three presenters have presented you may have some questions having heard other people and uh, so we'll have a short uh, period of uh, questions and answers and we want to save a few minutes at the end for some announcements so Anyway, uh, I have, uh, uh, I sent out the brief bios for, uh, and I'm not going to go completely re uh, go through that, but Jens is our first speaker, and he was uh, originally a, a geothermal uh, installer in, in Germany and moved to this country and has been working in the Buffalo area, and the, he's been installing many systems per year. A member of the New York Geo, and uh, I want to acknowledge that Bill Nowak, the uh, executive director of New York Geo, is in the back, so he'll be able to talk to you after the meeting also. Uh, Jens, you'll find, is incre incredibly enthusiastic about his product, and uh, it won't take you long to feel uh, understand that uh, great enthusiasm. So, Jens, you want to take it away? Sure. Inviting me, uh, and uh, uh, we enjoyed the drive down here. It's the first time I've been down here, so it's a beautiful surroundings. I was thrilled by it. I'll talk a little bit about geothermal, not just a little bit, for, for, for maybe half an hour here. And I just want to touch some of the points you mentioned here why geo, why, why the technology, why it comes. A lot of the stuff you probably already know, but I just want to emphasize on the certain things because. The landscape has changed so dramatically in the last two years, we were just talking on the way down here, that everybody goes from, even on the state level, they go from, well, let's expand and 
convert to clean gas towards like, no, oh, that's pretty dirty, that's still heat pumps. And uh, from the understanding that we have to electrify the heating sector, um, that because that's the only thing we can make renewable. And the big uh, emphasis is, uh, is, is there on costs and how can we accomplish that, and what are the ups and downs. So I'll walk you through a couple of projects, I'll give you some good examples, uh, and I'll tell you the way we, we look at the future of the technology. Um, true story, Her Majesty. Uh, 2004, she put in a request uh, to the parliament to tap into poverty funds <laughs> in order to heat her palace. That made the press in Britain. And the parliament turned the majesty down uh, by citing that this would be a PR nightmare. Um, so she kind of came to her senses and uh, uh, came up with the second cheapest way to heat her palace. The first one being to tap into somebody else's money. Um, and uh, so Buckingham Palace is now heated by geothermal. Which kind of tells you if we can do that in the middle of London, we can do that pretty much everywhere. Um, another example, you know, certainly St. Patrick's Cathedral in, in New York, uh, the Pope wants to be green. It was a $170 million renovation. And if you can think about a bigger nightmare project than putting a geosystem in the middle of Manhattan, in an, in an old cathedral, which is kind of the icon of uh, church architecture. Uh, and you can imagine what they have to go through to get this done. Uh, so you can see a, a drill rig parked right on the stairs. They had to lift it up and put it there, and they had to close down Fifth Avenue every morning. And then uh, they had to put sound blankets around and everything else. The nightmare of getting this done, I must give them a lot of credit. But you know, St. Patrick Cathedral is now on geothermal power. So, you know, again, the, the bottom line is if we can do it there, we can do it anywhere. So if, if you tell me a geothermal system is not possible in the building, we're not shying away from anything. Uh, people think it's crazy, but hey, it's all possible. It's just a will. Uh, the first thing, just to emphasize, geothermal is a big misnomer. We're not drilling for magma, I promise you that. We're not creating volcanoes here in the middle of of town. It's actually stored solar energy. 100% or I should say 99% of the energy comes from the sun, which heats up the upper layers of the earth. And you can see that we, we're dealing with about 50 degrees up here, uh, 60s in the Carolinas, 70s down in northern Florida, 80s on the southern tips of Florida. So it follows the solar gradient and we simply tip into that energy. The amazing part is to, to recover that energy, the sun doesn't have to shine. The wind doesn't have to blow. It's, it's really there when you need it. And uh, that makes it attractive. So the way this works is pretty much you have a <coughs> system of pipes either drilled or laid out in a horizontal layer. And you extract energy from the ground, which is about 50 degrees. And you put it into your house in that fashion. Now, the beauty is the heat pumps can go in reverse. Now, you can take the heat from the house and reject it to the ground. And you, you do that extremely efficiently because you don't reject it against 95 degree outside temperature, you do that against 50 degree nice and cold ground. And that's where the high efficiencies come in both heating and cooling. <clears throat> and the trick is you need some energy to do that. You need a compressor to do that. Every heat pump has a compressor in there. But the beauty is you get about, for every one amount of energy you use to transport the energy, you get about four units of energy out of the ground. So it's about four to 500% efficient. And that becomes exciting then, at the end of the day, if you can have that kind of efficiency in there. Just to make sure, the heat is not generated in any way. The heat is there. We just take it from another place and put it in the house. So this is an example here. These are slinkies we put in there just to save real estate. Uh, this is in the backyard here. 
uh, and usually there are 400, 500, 600, 1,000 feet long, depending on the design. And then you have multiple trenches depending on how much capacity. This is scalable. I mean, we have whole university campuses just powered by deal. Sometimes we have to drill. You can see that here. You just do it on the driveway, a couple of feet of the driveway, and you drill a hole and you circulate the water through, and the water comes into the house at 50 degrees. You take five degrees out, send it back out, let it heat up by five degrees again. And those five degrees is enough to, to heat your entire house with it. So just to be clear, because people say, well, maybe I can heat my house to 50 degrees. No, 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 no. The way this works is you have a refrigerant in the heat pump, and which is very, very cold. It's an expanded gas. And you, you guys were not from Europe. You've not been at a European soccer stadium. That's when the guys stand there, you know, half naked with one of those horns in their hand. And in the hot summer day, they all, they all don't wear shorts necessarily they wear a glove. The glove is for the compressed air bottle to power the horn. And when you release the pressure, the bottle becomes extremely cold. So it's a physical phenomenon where you expand the gas, it becomes extremely cold. So the heat pump is an expanded gas at zero degrees. And on the other side of the heat exchanger is the water flow through at 50. So some of the heat is transferred from the water into the gas, heats up the gas a little bit, compressor comes in, compresses it. Press the gas, the opposite happens. It's very hot. It's going to decrease. Now, that gas you can run through a coil, run some air over that coil. Your, your house air gets heated up from 70 to 100 degrees, heats your house. Then you expand that gas again, and this whole cycle starts all over again. Relatively simple, right? But this is how it works. So, we essentially usually design our systems to make about 100 degree of temperature coming out of the registers. I guarantee you, it's the entire house on your own. So this becomes important because if you understand that about three-fourths of the entire energy to heat a house goes into heating and cooling and hot water, that is a significant amount. The light bulbs and the appliances and the TVs and everything else, that's just a minor portion of it. The vast majority is the energy going into at least in our climate. And if you make that portion 500% efficient, then suddenly this whole thing is changing and uh, your hot water gets made very cheaply and you're heating in the AC and you can cut down about 50% of your total energy costs just by putting the gene system. That's uh, the, the entire purpose here. And this is why, this is an old slide, this is about 20 years ago, this is why Europe became extremely um, big marketplace for heat pumps. Uh, keep in mind, we don't have the luxury of having natural gas coming out of our ground. Uh, we depend on Mr. Putin for natural gas delivery, and we don't like that dependency very much. And uh, some countries were more progressive than others. You look at Sweden, uh, this is in new installs, and this is in retrofits. Sweden has about 95% of the market uh, geothermal heat pumps at that time. They don't even know anything else anymore. That was 20 years ago. Germany wants about 3-4% there, 25% or 35% now. They're all lift going up there. And then the retrofit market, meaning you rip out the old boilers and fossil fuel um, furnaces, and uh, you replace it with heat, uh, with heat pumps as well. Um, there are some nice examples where they have made all, all neighborhoods here. This is now the Habitat for Humanity, I believe in Oklahoma. And uh, they equipped all their houses with GOE pumps and, uh, and solar. And again, the, the energy they measured there was quite striking. Uh, this is about 95 uh, million BTUs per year use of a standard code minimum energy efficient house and uh, being on gas. And just by putting in the geo system, that cut down the energy usage down to by about 55%. Now they can do other measures like putting a low energy house in that cut it down further. And then if they put solar PV in there, they put it down. Energy usage is only 20% left. 
um, at that time. But the biggest impact was really the geosystem of all those measures. Now, this was about you know, 10, 15 years ago. Now we're getting towards zero here. By making the solar system larger, the geosystems have become even more efficient. And uh, that's why we have now the uh, net zero standard. But just to show you how, you know, even 15 years ago, um, this technology was there and could do all this. So these are kind of the houses uh, we build now, net zero houses uh, in whole neighborhoods like this. We have some very progressive builders in Buffalo. Uh, net zero is standard for them. Uh, they build nothing else. You have to opt out as a customer from getting a geo system, getting a PV system. And if you do that at this scale, now suddenly the price point changes. A new building, net zero standards, is approximately between three and five percent more expensive than a conventional building. If you count in all the incentives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for us, it has become a new normal. All the new builds we're doing with builders is all on net zero, nothing else anymore. And people don't have gas bills, people don't have electric bills, and that pays for the three to five percent more of cost. You put this in your financing, your cash flow part of it the first day. And this is why most of it is driven by obviously the money. This is how the system looks like. You have a heat pump that's about the size of your furnace, that's an expensive piece of equipment. Here are the hot water tanks, which are also powered with waste heat from, uh, from the geo system. During the winter time, the heat for the water tank is produced at the efficiency of the geo system. During the summertime, it's totally free because you're trying to get rid of heat. So you send it out to the loop field, and some of the water you actually divert to get into your water tank. Uh, we monitor all our systems. Again, usually it's a heat pump about the size of the furnace. Here's your return air. Here's your uh, supply air. Here's a, a flow center with some pumps. It goes out and in, and a couple of water tanks to make your water for your house as well. Um, these are the monitoring systems now we have for us becoming standard or has become standard. We can tell now exactly how much pumping power we have, um, how much um, compressor power do we use, uh, how much power do we use for the loop pump, what's the entering water temperatures. We have the same thing here. Um, and uh, we control pretty much everything from my living room couch. So if I see something uh, not going right, uh, I even call up the customer and say, hey, your float is a little dirty here uh, because the fan power is going up and uh, the temperature over the coil is, uh, the difference is too high. So, oh yeah, mm, I should check it. Yes, you should. So we, we kind of uh, uh, doing this. This is an example uh, of the houses. Uh, this is a new built house. Um, uh, New York State Energy Code, uh, we're using about 3,500 kilowatt hours uh, in total heat energy. That's about 12 cents a kilowatt hour, about 410, 420 dollars a year. Uh, that's about a 2,000 square foot house. Right? So that's what we see on average. And the customers have their thermostat there and they, they simply run it at 72 degrees and set it wherever they want to have it for cooling. And that's the cooling uh, load here. Usually, for cooling, we're paying about uh, between eight and twelve dollars a month, uh, roughly, for those systems. Uh, this is the monitoring now, which we have and which we see. This is the ER. Uh, you can see here. This is an ER of 20, 30, and 40. These are the data points over the season, and you can see the average is about somewhere in the low 30s in terms of ER. If you look at a regular energy started air conditioner, the CR rating is about 16, ER rating is about 12 to 13. So this is roughly well, between two and a half and three times as efficient as, as a really efficient air conditioner. And that's because, again, we have cold ground we reject the, the heat against. This is a COP, the coefficient of performance, how much energy goes in, how much energy goes out. Uh, you can see here the curve. These are ultra efficient units. These are variable speed units. The most modern ones we have, this is a five ton unit. Uh, this is a larger house, about 4,000 square foot. 
And you can see the efficiency it runs is around 600% here. Uh, for the compressor, you must add a little bit of pumping power and fan power to it. But we, these units here, they run about pumping power 3%, fan power about 5%. Um, add that to it. The COPs we see are anywhere between 4 and 5 for the most efficient units we have that. So our, it's really, really easy to get to net zero. You know, you have to improve the envelope of the building a little bit, which gets you about 20% energy savings. You put in a geo system and you supplement it with a solar roof, and you, which then you size the geo system so it powers, uh, you size the uh, solar roof so it powers the geo system, and you end so It's just a matter of uh, of running the math and understanding how it is, and uh, so people have zero bills anymore. Here are a couple examples, and uh, you know, I showed you a residential house, this is not an office building, it's actually the Lockport Housing Authority, um, and uh, a 9,000 square foot office building. Uh, they have a big lawn, so we decided to put a horizontal system in there, these are 27 loops here, uh, you can see the trench is worn off here. Nice clay, wonderful material, nice and compact around the pipes. Um, mechanical room, you can see three heat pumps there, they have a total of five there. And uh, uh, here was the energy impact of the whole site. So what we did is we measured the, uh, the energy use in kilowatt hours um, of the, um, the geo system as well as the heating system. So this was the electricity usage in 2013, and this was 2015 after it was converted. And uh, you can see here the electricity usage went up a little bit, but not very much because it also went down in the summer due to the more efficient cooling. Uh, but here's a gas usage, and we converted the kilowatt hours over to uh, the, the BTUs over to kilowatt hours. So this was before and this was after. So this whole site is now pretty much virtually emission free. This, the little usage they have left is they have emergency generators and they test run them once a week. That's much it. But it cut out the entire site emissions. The site is emission free and it slightly went up in the electrical usage. So the entire site dropped down by about 60% uh, roughly. So here's another graph from that conversion. Here is the, the gas usage, the energy usage in gas, the red line. This is the electricity usage here by the month. And you can see here, this was the last winter on, on natural gas. And from that moment on, it's virtually zero. And you can see here, this is the energy usage in the summer month, and this actually dropped down because the geosystem was more efficient. But keep in mind, this isn't the entire building. This is all the light bulbs and all the refrigerators and everything else to it. Otherwise, this would have dropped more. And yes, you see an increase in the winter time. Uh, but all gas is gone. And again, the whole site is emission free. So it was interesting that <coughs> in that project, we cut out about 160,000 kilowatt hours of, of gas, and the electricity went up by 13,000. Now, this looks weird because we're essentially doing the entire um, gas heating for about 8.5% of energy than we did before. Now, this would mean the geosystem is 1,200% more efficient. Okay, happy. Well, it is, it is, it is, and it isn't. The geo system operates up at about 500% efficiency, but the old gas system was not 100% efficient. As a matter of fact, it was only 70% efficient. It was what was accounted for was also the blower in the gas furnaces, and also the circulation pumps and the radiant systems. And they were old pumps, and they were rather inefficient. So the energy improvement here was over a tenfold, actually. 
because not necessarily the geo system is so wonderfully efficient, but it is, but also because the old system was so much less efficient. Keep in mind, in all your efficiency ratings for your furnaces, the blower is not accounted for at all. The circulation pump is not accounted for or radiant. That all needs to be added. And unfortunately, those old pumps are very inefficient. So this, this study here, this was actually a project which was just uh, published in the Ashford Journal here. And they wrote a nice editorial about it and saying, wow, this works in cold climate. We're like, <laughs> yeah, we've been doing this for a few years now. Um, and uh, they were actually intrigued by the amount of savings provided. And uh, uh, they, they sent this out to 50,000 engineers worldwide and uh, made this their feature articles. <coughs> actually, we're well received. Here's another project, multi-family project. The same housing authority then came in and said, hey, uh, we want uh, you now to convert our tenant stock. So these are 72 buildings, uh, 72 units, uh, all on electric heat. They don't have gas on site. Uh, so the heat bills were killing them, and they decided to convert everything to geo. This is actually the old administrative building, and I, I call it the memorial. These are the old footprints from the air conditioning. <laughs> and uh, I said uh, to the director, and I said, do you want us to remove this? He said, no, keep it. So every morning we walk by there. We remember how we lived in the Stone Ages. Uh, and, uh, uh, but you know what? Come up inside, and we talk about your new project. I said, no project. Well, we've got a few hundred housing units here. We need to convert. So. That worked out well. So this uh, this office building I showed you, they, they decided they were their own guinea pigs first before they put this on the tenant stock. And they said, hey, this works great. Said, oh. So for example, here we just converted 72 housing units in Lockport between 2015 and 2016. And we put those uh, console units in here. These are geothermal units. And you can see the geothermal pipes coming in into the, the, the apartments here. And uh, there are two room apartments, one bedroom, one living kitchen area, and they, so they have two pumps in total. And this is the energy usage. Um, again, this was unique because the entire site is on one meter. So we could answer a very simple question. What is the impact on the site if we just put in a geosystem? And uh, so this is, for example, 2013 here, uh, the yellow line. And this is the energy usage. This is in the summer. And they didn't have air conditioning before. And uh, here it goes up again in the winter time, what you would expect. Now, this is 2014 now, same trend, right, going up in the winter time, December. Now, this is 2015. You remember this was the coldest February on record here. Polar vortex was created, at least the term. And again, in the summer it goes down, and in the summer they obviously just have the regular electric water heating, etc. So now this is when we started the conversion, and you can see it took us nine months, almost a year, but we already started to really put a dip into the energy usage. And then this is 2016 comes along, and we finish the conversion here. Now everybody is now on air conditioning, on central air conditioning. And despite that, the side energy went down another 30%. Why? Because the hot water heat is now made with, with geothermal as well. And now we're seeing pretty much record low. This was now 2017. So we cut pretty much the entire site down by a total of 50 to 60%, just putting in the geosystem. So, you know, this is the last building I want to show you, this Yano building. Uh, you can see um, there's this is the end of the lot here, and this is the foot walk around, and there is no room whatsoever. So what do you do? Well, you, you put the loop field under the building. Well, what if it leaks? Well, it won't leak. Never leaks. So you can see here the drill rig drilling before the building goes up. This is not the building, but this is the new building going up next door. And these are all the gas meters here. We were kind of laughing about this, and the architects laughed about it and said, yeah, that's, that's the Stone Age. Um, this is also the building next door because they don't know where to put their chiller. So they can't put it on the roof because it's too heavy, so they had to build it in the parking lot uh, and put the chiller on top of it. Um, 
again, we won't have that. No outside bending of the furnaces. We won't have that either. So this is all you saw from the outside, from the geosystem, those three pipes coming out. This is all we had underneath the building. Here were the economics for that building, just to show you how geo can work. Uh, the system costs were about $180,000. And uh, so the cheapest the conventional system they had a bid on was about 140000 so there, it was forty thousand dollars more important, uh, more not important, but um, and more expensive. But they also saved twelve thousand dollars in gas lines for the building on the infrastructure costs there. Uh, there were some NYSERDA rebates applied to, but the NYSERDA rules they're very strict about efficiency and complying with certain rules. So the system was slightly more expensive because of that. So there was still about a $12,000 cap gap in total. Now the interesting part is now that they were asking $45 more for rent um, because they said you don't have a gas bill anymore. And the average gas bill for an apartment is about $45 a year. And they could get a $200 higher rent for the store because of the, the, the reduced air conditioning costs here. So they have about uh, $12,000 more in rental income because of the geosystem. Smart. So uh, the tenants were willing to pay more because they clearly saw the savings even ahead of time. A uh, little, little um, couple more minutes here on the gas expansion network here. And this is where we're scratching our head a little bit too. Uh, I put off some public service commission filings here. And this was in Plattsburgh. Um, and the total cost of the expansion was about eight million dollars, and they had an estimated 443 new customers. So the cost to the utility of the expansion was 18,500 dollars for the utility. The customers' costs were approximately 8,000 dollars to convert their equipment to natural gas and approximately $8,700 as a surcharge for the 10 years. So both of them invested a significant amount of money to convert to gas, and we were scratching our head why. Why would we invest in technology which you're trying to get rid of, e.g. Uh, trying to reduce the carbon footprints here? Uh, the utilities, interestingly, they're not interested in it either anymore because they need a 50 to 100 year payback. And they're afraid that they're putting a, something in now, which is gonna be obsolete in 10 or 15 years. Um, because most people will switch over to heat pump technology. And the term stranded assets is really scaring them. Um, and they've seen that in other countries in Europe. So we need to electrify the heating sector. Uh, electricity is really the only thing in any medium of energy we can make renewable. And the electrically driven heat pumps are really the only solution we have uh, to solve that problem. We have to realize that. Um, Denmark, for example, as an example, <laughs> banned fossil fuels. In 2013, they banned oil and gas furnaces in new bills. In 2016, they banned them in all the retrofits. They're done. It's all heat pump driven, the whole country. Imagine if you're a furnace manufacturer. <laughs> Germany didn't go as far. They didn't say, oh, they, they simply said, well, we're going to not say you can't put them in anymore, but we raised the standards so each heat source in your house has to be 125% efficient. <laughs> Okay, no word anymore. But that is a new standard since 2016 in Germany. For new words. California passed the law to be net zero in 2020. Done. And how are you going to do that with a gas furnace? BMW has announced that they're all electric by 2025. They will build no other regular car anymore. It will all be electric drivetrains. So is Volvo, so is Lotus. So that was, that's the debt. So Norway announced 2025, they're moving towards banning cars by then. 
Netherlands the same, Belgium has joined them by now, and India has as well. You see the writing on the wall and the date, what's coming up? Yes, and Germany too, they said uh, they have voted to ban, the parliament has voted to ban internal combustion engines by 2030. So we're moving rapidly. New York City has put a law into effect to require geothermal systems in public buildings. It has to be cost effective, but they're the first ones to put actually costs on the carbon emissions to make gas essentially penalized and pay for this. So the last two slides here, I want to emphasize a couple of things. This is the amount of CO2 emissions in New York State. They, convert, they cut out all the coal plants and this made a significant reduction. But right now, here's where we are. We've got to get there. That's our mandate by 2030. This is when our current policies continue to go like they are. They already cut everything out of the electricity sector they can in a quick way by stopping the coal plants. But if we don't change our public policy, we're not going to get there. We're not on the trajectory at all. And that's their own data. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. statewide organization uh, that's been formed called Re Renewable Heating Now. Uh, it's, and uh, a lot of uh, geothermal installers are participating in that uh, organization. We're going to be doing a statewide tour in other communities that don't have as much interest uh, at, the, at the moment as we do here. Uh, but when we were looking for uh, speakers, uh, it was readily uh, apparent we, we were already in contact with a number of geothermal folks. And we've been working with New York Geo on the tax credits and uh, for a couple of years uh, for these systems. And uh, so, I mean, there is no professional association, as far as I know, in New York State that promotes air source heat pumps. So we had a stretch in, uh, you know, we'd have somebody that already would advise us who we could choose. So we uh, had to reach out to Vermont and uh, bring in Bruce Harley today, and uh, he was it was very fortunate for us to get him. He has an art opening tonight. He has to race out of here and go back to Vermont. And, uh, you know, I, as I said before, you have his bio already. He's worked uh, a lot in retrofits uh, for 30 years. He's written a number of books. And, uh, you know, so here's Bruce. background in graphics or things like that and I welcome questions but no matter what question you ask me I always have just one answer it depends <laughs> um, when I started in 1990 um, with conservation services group I was doing um, lower door air sealing in electric heated houses and specifying insulation and if you had told me then that in 2012 I would live in an all-electric house that I designed and built myself that was uh, heated and cooled with air source heat pumps, I would have said you were absolutely nuts. Um, but I have been working with air conditioners and heat pumps for that whole time. Back in the early 90s, I was testing air conditioners and then heat pumps uh, for efficiency and capacity, um, trying to make them more efficient. In 1994, I started testing ground source heat pumps. Um, so this history goes back pretty pretty far. I was the technical director of CSG, um, so 15 or $20 million company that was um, operating. Um, 
energy efficiency programs all over the country. Um, and then for the last year and a half, I've been independent um, as, a, as a consultant. And most of my work has been uh, involved with air source heat pumps. So that's the, that's the very quick version. I am, according to the program that we sent out, I'm basically going to touch on four, um, four basic subjects. Why someone would want to choose an air source heat pump, what equipment works well in cold climates, uh, I think it's safe to say we live in a cold climate, even though it seems to be warming up. The warming is slow uh, in any particular location, and uh, we still have pretty cold temperatures here in the winter. How do you design systems properly, and what are some common problems that you can avoid to help ensure high efficiency? So those last two bullets kind of go hand in hand. What, you know, what to do right, and then sort of what to avoid so that you don't run into trouble. Um, actually, uh, Janice had a good introduction about what a heat pump is. It's basically a refrigerator or an air conditioner. Um, you know, every refrigerator and freezer you have in your kitchen takes food that's cold and it extracts heat out of it at a very cold temperature and dumps it into a warmer place, which is your kitchen. Um, and heat pumps work the same way. They basically use that compressor cycle to concentrate the heat and move it into a warmer space. Uh, and then deliver that. In air conditioning, it's just the reverse. You're taking heat out of the cool indoor air and delivering it somewhere to a warmer place, whether it's underground or uh, into the outside air. Um, a colleague of mine had a good slide that sort of showed ductless heat pumps. And I'm not here just to talk about ductless heat pumps, but a lot of the new air source heat pumps that are going in are ductless. Um, and the, the basic way it works is there's an indoor unit there's an outdoor unit. There's a collection of pipes and wires that run between the two called the line set. Um, and then there's some sort of control. And most of these units have a handheld remote, just like your TV. You tell it to run warmer or run cooler, turn on, off, turn the fan on, whatever you want to do with that remote control. Uh, so a little bit of background on heat pumps in homes because um, I, I was uh, asked to sort of focus on residential. Um, back in the 1980s in the Northeast, there were a lot of heat pumps put in. There was a building boom of uh, condos, and a lot of developers put them in because they were an inexpensive way to get air conditioning and heating in the same package. And they were done very, very badly. Does anyone here have an opinion about the general construction quality of those condos that were built in, in mass in the 80s? Well, the heat pump installations were no different. Uh, there were a lot of issues with leaky ductwork, uh, ch uh, refrigerant charge and airflow problems. And one of the biggest issues with these air source heat pumps is they had a backup heating source that was an electric resistance auxiliary heat. Okay, it's basically a giant toaster in the ductwork that sits there and it comes on when the heat pump isn't able to produce enough heat to heat the house. So all of these problems that affected the efficiency of the unit were masked by those electric resistance heaters and it made it seem like they were really, really inefficient because the electric resistance heaters in and of themselves were inefficient and the leaky ducts actually made them even less efficient. In the Pacific Northwest, they did a study in the 80s and they actually found that heat pump heated houses use more electricity to heat than electric resistance baseboard heated houses, even though theoretically the efficiency was something like you know, two to two and a half times as much. They actually use more energy. Um, so basically, this led to a widespread belief that air source heat pumps don't work in cold climates. It wasn't because the climate was too cold. It was because the most of the installations, or at least a, a, a large majority of the installations, were done very, very badly, and this electric resistance heat, uh, you know, made up the difference. So if, if, if your heating system doesn't produce enough heat, most people will call their installer and say, my house is cold, can you come out and look at the system? And maybe there was something wrong. But with that giant toaster and the ductwork, that masked the problem, and nobody knew to call their installer and say, hey, this thing isn't working. Now, the, the ductless split heat pumps, um, you've seen these things, right? The little pictures that I showed you, they're in hotel lobbies and restaurants and different places all over. Um, these things have been around for at least 40 years, uh, originating in Japan. Um, they started out as a single point cooling, where you'd have one indoor unit and one outdoor unit, 
um, and it was an alternative to the room air conditioner. And basically, over the over the last uh, four or five decades, there have been a lot of advances, um, a much wider range of system size, so the amount of heating or cooling capacity, um, adding heating in so that it's not just an air conditioning solution. Um, Multi-zone systems that can have anywhere from two or three up to seven or eight different indoor <coughs> um, indoor uh, air handler units for separate zones in the building. Um, small ducted systems. Uh, a lot of different options for uh, what the indoor unit looks like and, and how it can deliver heat cooling into the house. Vast it, it increases in efficiency. And a lot of this has been accomplished by uh, variable speed, it's sometimes called the inverter systems. Uh, the inverter name is, is not necessarily the important thing, but the variable speed is. And as Jen said, with the high-end ground source heat pumps, they also use variable speed. But um, not all mini-split heat pumps have variable speed uh, drives, but certainly all of the high efficiency ones do, and that's uh, quite common. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit in a few minutes about how to find Right equipment for cold clients. Uh, it's essentially this variable speed is important if you think about driving your car um, from point A to point B in the city. It's going to be less efficient if you stomp on the gas and accelerate as fast as possible and drive at 50, 55 miles an hour and then stomp on the brake at the next stoplight. If you go at 35 miles an hour, does anyone here have a Prius or any other vehicle that tells you what the efficiency is while you're driving? You know that if you're going sort of slow and steady, you start to see that efficiency go way, way up. So they cycle less, they turn down their heating or cooling capacity when there's a low demand, and that gives you a much, much higher efficiency. Um, certainly optimizing them for cold weather heating. Now people often say, how do I get heat out of five degrees, zero degree, minus five, minus 10 degree outdoor air? There's not much heat in that air, and it's true. It takes a little more energy to get the heat out, and the efficiency drops a little bit as you get into those cold temperatures. But it's really a matter of design for the conditions that you want the system to operate at. And 20, 25 years ago, most heat pumps weren't designed to operate um, at high efficiencies in those cold temperatures because people were relying on that backup electric heat. Um, nowadays, we can get um, heat pumps that are designed to maintain their rated capacity, that's sort of their, their standard capacity at much warmer temperatures, and they'll maintain 100% of that rated capacity, sometimes down to plus 5 degrees, sometimes down to minus 5 or even minus 15. And then what happens after that is the capacity does start to drop off a little bit as it gets cooler, but they don't stop running. All right, my heat pumps that I installed in 2012, which are actually two generations ago of the cold climate technologies, it could be minus 25 in the morning and the, the heat pump is still cranking out heat and my house is still comfortable. So I can tell you from personal experience that these things actually do work. The, the backup electric resistance heat is rare. Um, some of the more conventional systems, and we are seeing these cold climate air source heat pumps also in a sort of central ducted system that you would see in a lot of houses replacing a furnace or replacing an older heat pump. Um, those are more likely to have the electric backup heat, but if you size them properly, you really don't need that because you do have those higher capacities at cold temperatures. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit, uh, some pictures of the flexibility that we're talking about here. Um, you know, the conventional wall-mounted air handlers, they're starting to make more slim and sleek looking designs. Um, some people don't like these, some people don't mind them at all. I actually had a colleague who said his his family, his, his, his wife said, I'm never going to put one of these things in my house. And he waited until she went away for a few days on a business trip. And he actually built a mock-up out of cardboard and put it above the kitchen door. And he said it was, it was about five days she got home, she hadn't even noticed it. And he finally pointed it out to her, and she's like, all right. <laughs> but uh, some of the manufacturers are starting to come out with uh, different kinds of designs that have curved fronts. and blend in a little bit more in you know, some of the high-tech uh, environments of, of people's houses. But there are a lot of other options. This is a little duct system, a little air handler. This is not what you'd see. This would be hidden in a soffit or above 
above your ceiling and basically driving a conventional you know air register um, you can get units that mount right in the ceiling and this actually has that indoor evaporator coil and all the controls built right into it so this is just a one-to-one -one replacement for one of these it's just a different type of application and you can plan that depending on the layout of the house and, and what works best for you aesthetically and, and, and physically in the house this is actually my living room i use the conventional wall mounted unit but we had to put it down low because there wasn't much wall space in our house and we need that wall space for art um, and it actually works really, really well mounted down low because on our first floor, most of the load is heating, right? We hardly ever turn on the first floor unit for air conditioning. We turn on the upstairs unit for air conditioning. And the first floor unit heats our house. <coughs> the first winter I tried using the second floor system when it got really, really cold and my wife and daughter both complained that the bedrooms were too warm. So I, I don't turn them on. And this delivers the heat down low, closer to the floor. And I just feel it's a little more comfortable and it works a little better, especially for a larger space. You know, most people's first floor in a two-story house is gonna be somewhat open, kitchen, living room, dining room area, You're trying to heat a larger space. It's hard to do that from up high on the wall, right? That high wall application was originally designed for cooling because that's where these things started. And they work fine for a small room, but for larger spaces, I don't necessarily recommend taking a, a wall unit like that that's designed for a high wall mounting and putting it low on the floor, but you can put in a ducted system underneath the floor, or you can use uh, units that are designed, uh, and I've got pictures of those that, that come up a little bit later. In my second floor, uh, I just have a small air handler like I showed you before, and just a very conventional 8 inch by 8 inch um, ceiling registers in each of the three bedrooms. That works really, really well. Um, there's a few sort of standard applications that we find these air source heat pumps are being used. Um, and, and I say DHP for ductless heat pump because that's what most of it has been. Um, but I'm, again, not limiting it to just ductless. Oftentimes we put in a single zone or a couple of zones to offset an existing heating source. And the point is not necessarily to heat the entire house 100% of the year because you're leaving the existing heating system in place and that can handle you know, peak cold periods. So you don't have to worry quite so much about whether you have enough heating capacity to heat the whole house. And for existing homes, this can actually end up being a very, very efficient and cost-effective way to, to reduce your use of LP gas, oil, or electric resistance heating. Certainly, in some cases, we see complete replacement. One of the things I recommend to people is if you have an older furnace or boiler, but it's not malfunctioning, it's still working okay, go ahead and put in that one or two zones of an air source heat pump, get used to it, see how it works, find that it actually produces more of the heat in your house than you, than you expected, and then when it comes time that you actually have to replace the furnace or boiler, you're going to have to spend some money anyway. So then at that point, you can put in another two or three zones and you're heating and cooling your entire house and you're not really adding a lot of extra investment in that process. Certainly with new homes, this is a, a really great way to deal with heating and air conditioning. Uh, even new homes that are built to code today, minimum code, the energy standards for minimum codes are so much better than they were even five, especially 10 or 15 years ago. The actual heating load of a typical new single family home is so small that you really only need probably two or three zones. And these are a very, very good match for low energy homes that people are in. Uh, new construction programs like Energy Star or Lead for Homes or even you know the more <coughs> advanced sort of low energy design like uh, like passive house um, it gets very very easy to heat these systems with a very small to heat these homes with a very small air source heat pump and it's actually one of the issues is if you have a low load home a house that's designed to use very very little heating under peak outdoor conditions it's hard to find conventional equipment that's small enough to match that load you end up over investing and having equipment that doesn't run very efficiently because it's not the right size. So some of the money that gets invested in making the house more efficient actually can go towards, you know, can, can, some of that money can come from putting in a less expensive heating system. 
in a lot of cases, these very efficient new homes don't need central heat delivered to every room. You can get by with just one or two or maybe three uh, ductless heat pump heads. Uh, certainly an isolated zone, like if you've got a bonus room over a garage that just never got heated and cooled properly, it's not comfortable. Uh, an addition is often that kind of situation. Somebody adds a family room on the end of their house. Um, that could be a great application, even if your existing heating system works fine and you don't want to mess with it, you could just add a single zone um, heat pump for, for that space. Um, I, I'm actually curious, no one asked the question, how many people here are particularly interested in new construction applications? Okay, so yeah, 30, 30, 40%. How many here are particularly interested in existing homes or thinking about buying one for your house? Um, so, similar numbers. All right. So there's some balance. Um, I, I highlighted this because uh, that, that was the request to sort of focus on. But most of what I'm going to say really applies to, to, to both situations. The, the main differences are essentially the things that I just outlined in those, in those application descriptions. Um, so why would I choose a heat pump? High efficiency and low operating costs. I'll, I'll show you an example in just a minute of the measurements that I made in my house. Um, because of that, it's better for the environment. Again, as Jen said, the only way we can really eliminate carbon from our heating and cooling is to put in electric air, heat pumps, whether they're air source or ground source heat pumps, and have low carbon grid power or zero carbon grid power powering them. If you put on a large enough uh, photovoltaic array on your house to cover your annual heat pump use plus your other electric use, then you essentially have a zero carbon house at that point. And you don't have to wait for the grid to become zero carbon to get to that, to that level on a, on a personal basis. Another thing about these um, heat pumps is that they're easy to zone. The, the multi-zone systems, instead of trying to run air ducts to multiple areas of the house and you know, to get a little bit into the engineering, when you have air ducts and you try to make zones by opening and closing dampers, that hurts the efficiency of that ducted system substantially. Now, most installers who put those systems in won't tell you that, but I've got colleagues who've done a lot of measurements of this stuff uh, in labs and in the field, and it makes a really, really significant uh, impact on the delivered efficiency when you're closing off zones in a ducted system. It also takes a lot of space to run those ducts to various corners of the house. With a, with a multi-zone ductless or mini-split heat pump, you have essentially a small bundle of pipes and wires, and even in an existing home, you can run those from room to room. You can hide them along baseboards or hide them up above the ceiling, run them through closets from one floor to another. It's much, much easier to get separate zoning so that you can control uh, your heating and cooling um, at, at different levels in the house. Uh, they're quite affordable. Typically, uh, installed costs somewhere between $3,500 and $5,000 for a single zone system. And uh, in new construction, it's probably closer to the lower end of that because you've got trades in there anyway and you've, you're, you're not dealing with trying to drill through existing surfaces and patching them up and that sort of thing. For multi-head systems, the cost is actually similar on a per zone basis. It, de it tends to be a little bit less expensive to put in three zones of a multi-zone system <coughs> instead of three separate single-zone systems. But it's not a lot cheaper. It's you know typically maybe 15 to 25% cheaper per, per zone. And there may be some advantages in some cases of keeping the zones on separate outdoor units. So, um, so uh, you know that cost differential is only one part of it. Um, another thing for for new construction certainly um, is the opportunity to avoid having a gas mill at all, even if you're in a location where there's natural gas. The heating operating cost is actually not that different from high efficiency new gas because gas is so cheap right now. But if you don't have to pay the 15 or 18 dollars a month or whatever it is to have the gas meter in place. That's another couple hundred dollars a year, which is a pretty significant amount if you're talking about a house that only costs three or four hundred dollars a year to heat in its entirety. Okay, so I actually have one colleague out in Minnesota who did a renovation on his house and uh, cut the gas line, and, and he, he previously had natural gas heat, but he put in a 
couple zones of uh, air source heat pump and now it doesn't have to pay a gas bill at all. So that's what made it cost effective for him. How, how efficient is it? Uh, when I bought my heat pumps, I had previously heated my house with a wood stove and with a little bit of a radiant heat that ran off of my uh, propane gas hot water heater. Um, but my water heater started leaking, so I scrapped that and I put in an electric water heater with a solar PV coil, uh, electric heating coil as, as the backup uh, heat for that. And I bought the heat pumps. So to measure everything, I basically I heated the house. These green dots here are heating my house with an electric resistance heater. Three little 1200 watt space heaters bought at like a Kmart. Um, we're heating my house. It's, a, it's about a 2,400 square foot house. It's not near zero. It's not super, super efficient. I built it in 94. And it's modestly energy efficient. Um, so I got a baseline of what's the actual heating load under different, this is indoor outdoor temperature difference. So this is like 50 degrees outside and that's like zero degrees outside or minus 10. And so these were the daily average temperatures with the electric heat, and this is the amount of energy it took per day to heat the house. And then these were the data points running that heat pump for that same winter for all the days that, that I ran the heat pump exclusively. And it's essentially almost a three to one difference. So my net efficiency is a little less than 300%. Okay, not quite as high as what you get with the ground source heat pumps, but it's much, much less expensive to install. I didn't have to do any digging or drilling. And one of the things I found interesting is I did a projection, right? I'm an engineer, so I had to calculate everything in advance. I looked at the climate and I looked at the manufacturer specs for the equipment performance and the different outdoor temperatures. And I made a, a, a projection of uh, energy consumption about 3,000 kilowatt hours. And it actually ended up being a little less than that. So it performed a little better than I expected. Cost me about $400. Electric rates are fairly high in Vermont. But, you know, this is actually pretty comparable to, to Jen's example of a 2,400 square foot house using, I think in that example, it was 3,400 kilowatt hours a year. But we're right in the same ballpark. So the, the, the differences in performance are not that large, even though the numerical rating may, may look uh, different. You get a lot more savings going from an efficiency of two to one, or from one to two, like an electric resistance heater is 100% efficient. A, a kind of poor performing heat pump might be 200% efficient. You're saving half there. When you go from two to three, you're only saving another 30% of the original. So the, the, the difference as you go from a COP of two to three and three to four, the, it's kind of a shrinking return there. Um, so what works well in cold climates? Um, without going into a lot of technical detail, this organization, um, NEEP, is the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership. Um, they actually are, it's a, it's a nonprofit that sort of maintains a coalition of New England, New York, mid-Atlantic states working on regional energy efficiency initiatives. And they've been working on air source heat pump initiatives for several years now, and I've been involved with that. Um, they've put together a listing of cold climate heat pumps. So there are a few criteria. The HSPF, which is the standard DOE uh, efficiency rating for heat pumps, has got to be greater than 10. That number isn't really meaningful, by the way. The HSPF rating doesn't actually represent the performance in this climate. Um, it's, I, I kind of liken it to the Volkswagen emissions test for measuring efficiency of heat pumps. Um, except that unlike Volkswagen, they weren't doing it on the slide, right? This is actually required by federal regulation that all manufacturers have to test it this way. But it's still a benchmark. It's, you know, the, the more efficient systems still have higher HSPF ratings, and the less efficient systems have lower ratings. So that's uh, one requirement. The cold weather performance, so at five degrees outdoor temperature, the equipment has got to have a coefficient of performance of at least one and three quarters, okay? So it's true that 
that's not as good as three or four or five, but that's at five degrees outdoor temperature. There aren't that many hours of the year, even in a cold climate, where the temperature is five degrees or colder. Generally, these things have COPs that are well over two, even at temperatures of 10, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And most of your heating hours in the year are going to be at higher temperatures where the efficiencies are even higher. Um, other things to look at, and this is not requirements for the need cold climate listings, but looking for main, uh, equipment that maintains a high output at cold temperatures, and that's something that you can get from looking at these listings because they're required to uh, disclose their performance at 5 degrees, at 17 degrees, and at 47, so you can look in the listings to see which ones uh, maintain uh, high outputs at very cold temperatures. And many of these systems have rated operation down to minus 5 or minus 15. And like I said, that doesn't mean they shut off at minus 5 or minus 15. They'll still keep working and producing heat. In my case, I've had nights that are down minus 25, minus 27, and my heat pump's still producing heat. I've, I've never had to use supplemental heat in my house. And I still don't turn on the upstairs unit in the winter. <laughs> This is just an example. When you go to that website, and I'll, I'll show you, there's a slide where I have a uh, little more detail on getting navigating to this website. But basically, it's an Excel spreadsheet that you can download. You can sort it by manufacturer or brand. And there's a lot of information here. A lot of it is technical information that makes sense to engineers. Uh, but the important point is that for someone who's designing a system, there's actually more complete information in this listing than there is in a lot of manufacturers sort of marketing information. And one of the things that we tried to do when we created this cold climate listing process was to make sure that designers could have access to consistent information that's reported across multiple manufacturers and multiple product lines in the same way. So you actually have performance at five degrees, you have maximum heating output, minimum heating output, and what the efficiencies are across that range at five degrees for every single product that's in the listing. And that's something that was very, very hard to, to find and look at um, across different product lines and different manufacturers before that. So designing systems well. Uh, the NEEP website also has two guides that we recently produced. Uh, I actually was a consultant that worked with NEEP on this using some funding from the Department of Energy. So they have a um, sizing and selection guide and an installation guide. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about these because they're readily available for people. But if you go to NEAT.org and look under initiatives, which is sort of one of the top tier uh, drop down menus and find air source heat pumps, then on the right hand side there are a couple of substantial links that you can see. Um, and one of them is air source heat pump installer resources, and that will send you to both of these guides. And the other one is cold climate air source heat pump, and that's the, that's the link to the cold climate listing that I was just showing you. Um, this is just a view of what the sizing and selecting guides look like. And basically, there are five separate sheets, depending on whether you're putting it in an existing home to displace an existing heating system doing a full replacement, doing an isolated zone. There's another one for new construction, and there's actually one for cooling focus because some customers, frankly, really just want cooling and don't care about their heating. I think they should still take advantage of the high efficiency of a heat pump because it doesn't cost that much more to install. But this is just kind of a, a, a map of what that looks like. And then the installation guide, there's some introductory material, and then essentially there's a uh, sort of a checklist format with a lot of information there. Most of the items in this installation guide, if you actually look closely, are exactly the same as manufacturer's recommendations for how to do an installation. So what we're proposing that people do isn't really any different than what the industry is saying, this is how you should install these units. But not all installers pay attention to those manufacturer's instructions. Um, I, I think it's kind of a guy thing, like nobody wants to be seen reading the directions. We're supposed to know how it works. <laughs> Right? So one of my colleagues was saying at the conference a couple of days ago, you know, if, if you don't want to be seen reading the directions, go sit out in your truck at lunchtime and read the directions there. But you've got to read the directions. Um, a few ideas, uh, just sort of 
points to make about uh, things to pay attention to. Uh, make sure that you size them carefully. If you're going to produce all of the heating for a house, you want to make sure that the machine will generate that heat at your outdoor design condition. Around here, that design temperature is what, plus 5 or plus 3 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. We know it gets colder than that, but it's not that many hours a year that it's colder than that. And this is a standard way to do load calculations. And you want to make sure that you use the equipment specs at design conditions. Don't just say, oh, it's a two-ton system that's rated at 24,000 BTUs per hour. That's the nominal size. It's really, really important to make sure you look at the actual uh, information for that product. And that's one of the places where that uh, five-degree performance that's in the NEEP listing is, is, a, is a key area that you can, you can look at and, and sort of verify that you're using the right information. I've been trying to emphasize to people don't sort of fall for the line of, hey, these heat pumps are great because you can put a zone in every single room and have individual room control. That's true, but it's an expensive way to go. And I think it's much more important to use those zones strategically. And for most houses, um, you know, two or three zones, if it's a smaller property, a condo or an apartment, one or two zones is generally enough as long as you don't have a space that's like very, very isolated thermally from the rest of the building. And one of the things that I often really suggest is um, instead of separate zones for small bedrooms, the energy loads in those bedrooms is probably 1,500 to 2,500 BTUs per hour, and the smallest heat pump indoor heads are six or 9,000 BTUs per hour, depending on uh, the manufacturer and the product line. So you really would be oversizing for multiple bedrooms, and that can cause problems with the way the equipment operates. So we're really looking at small ducted systems if you're going to serve multiple uh, multiple bedrooms with small loads as a more cost-effective way to do that and actually operating more efficiently. Um, another, op another good uh, option that we'd like to see is for first floor. Remember I was saying mounting that unit lower on the wall? These floor mount, so-called floor mount units, are actually designed to deliver the heat down low. They blow the air out at the bottom during the heating mode, and in air conditioning mode, they blow the air up out through the top, and so it ends up being a, a very, very good way to operate um, for both heating and cooling, especially in a larger open space on a, on a first floor or lower floor of the house. Um, might not be so attractive for a new construction situation, although I think there, you were showing us a console of a uh, uh, pretty similar look for the ground source heat pump, but certainly in a retrofit, I mean, you can see here, they just took out a radiator and put this unit right in place. Um, and you know, certainly for a low profile kind of hidden application, having a small uh, air handler just underneath the floor and having a few floor ducts is a good way to do that. Um, a few things to pay attention to not to do. Um, uh, certainly following manufacturer's instructions carefully is important, um, as I said before. Um, here are a few items that are often sort of misapplied or misunderstood. Um, Keeping things above the snow line is really, really important. Uh, I've got a few pictures I'll show you. Uh, the, the outdoor unit can't reject heat or, or absorb heat from the outside air if it's clogged up with snow and ice. Now, this unit didn't happen to be running, but it's something to watch out for in periods of really severe snowfall or if there's a power outage. Make sure that you clear the snow away from that unit before you turn the unit back on or before the power comes back on, because it's not going to be able to defrost if it's in that kind of situation. But the, 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 basic, uh, the basic idea is keep it above the snow line, 18 inches to two feet off the ground. And it's important um, to be a little bit attentive to the, the potential for noise. You don't want to be mounting this on a wall bracket right behind the master bedroom, because although they do operate very, very quietly, especially in cooling mode, in the cold weather, you know, when the, when the frequency and the, the speed of the heat pump ramps up, they, they do make enough sound that you're not going to want it mounted on the wall right behind your head when you're sleeping. Um, so a couple of different options. You do have to be careful with, uh, with ground mounts on stands that uh, you, you stay away from a situation where you can have a frost heave. In this case, there's a nice deck there, so that wasn't an issue. Um, this is a wall-mounted situation, but it's a, 
it's actually a, an eight inch thick wall and it's right, uh, right behind the kitchen. And even in the very coldest weather, this is not as loud indoors as the refrigerator is. So, you know, you have to use a little bit of common sense in those kind of applications. Um, some of these units have what's called a drain heater or pan heater for uh, cold weather when they defrost. The, mo the moisture that's coming off of that coil drips down in the bottom. And what we've found is that um, even in very cold climates in Maine, they're installing uh, something like 400 of these a month on average for the last three or four years in Maine. And as long as you can keep them away from eaves, or if they are under an area where you can't avoid uh, dripping off the roof, you have a drip diverter over the top of it like this. And so as long as it's not getting extra moisture from above, um, they really don't need the pan heaters and they can operate very, very well um, without that extra energy load. I found this one out the hard way. Actually, this is a, a, a friend of mine took this uh, picture in New Pulse last uh, week or a couple weeks ago, um, the afternoon after a big thunderstorm went through. And this HVAC installer said, oh yeah, we're, we're replacing like six of them up and down the street because they got knocked out by surges. I had that problem on one of my units and I had to, re I had to replace the board myself. And I'll tell you, it was no fun. Um, so a $50 surge protector is not a guarantee, but it's gonna definitely help. And I, I like this one actually, it has a little green light on the side. So when an event happens, it actually uses up its capability to absorb that that transient electric surge, the light is going to go out and I'm going to know I need to either service it or replace it. So, Roy, so I really need to wrap it up. It's a good investment, yep. Rodent proofing. Uh, there's a few things about controls and settings. Probably the most important of all of these is uh, don't set the temperature back and then up every day. It actually, with these variable speed systems, it actually uses more energy <laughs> and it's better to let it set it and forget it, leave it at a comfortable setting, and uh, let it just uh, operate at a slow and steady pace. Um, so those things are on here. You'll have access to the, uh, the whole presentation. I think uh, it's going to be distributed to everyone who's interested. Thank you. So anyway, the, the question I get from my friends, the architects, most, it's not about technology, it's about the incentives that are available. So we're here to uh, allay those uh, folks' concerns that there are incentives, there's technical support. Uh, Scott Smith is here from NYSERDA in their recently formed Office of Renewable Heating and Cooling, and he, he's been preparing products uh, to uh, you know, educate people on what the uh, uh, available incentives are, and uh, we been working closely with uh, Scott for the, at least the last year and a half. We did, uh, HeatSmart has done some uh, enrollee um, uh, you know, meetings uh, with their, so that they could get information to help design their marketing program. So uh, anyway, without further ado, Scott Smith. So heating, you know, we, have this, we have carbon goals in New York that we're trying to meet 30% by 2030, 50% by 2050. They're pretty aggressive. Um, and you know, our group sort of knows this pretty well. Um, uh, but, but we had to sort of demonstrate this to our colleagues and to the rest of the state. Heating and cooling is responsible for about a third of our greenhouse gas emissions. So you can completely decarbonize the grid. You can completely decarbonize um, uh, vehicles and we still couldn't hit our risk of carbon targets. So it's, it's extremely important for us to decarbonize heating and cooling. Um, we, uh, you know, so we're, we're, we're aware about planning in New York for sure, and especially NYSERDA is, is, is big on planning. 
Um, so one of the first things that our group did is to develop a policy framework, which sort of, you know, sort of demonstrated that what I just said clearly with some calculations, um, and developed sort of a short, 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 medium, and long-term approach um, to growing the renewable heating and cooling industry. Um, it was based on sort of identifying and removing barriers, um, looking at what mandates uh, we, we could put in place, and the ends did a great job of showing us what the mandates look like around the rest of the um, rest of the world. Um, we're far from probably doing some of those at the state level in New York, but hopefully we can do some locally. Um, and then in the near term, we wanted to get some incentives on the street to make this technology more affordable and you know, get customers uh, putting them in. Um, so there's a really large technical potential for renewable heating and cooling. Um, uh, about 700,000 terabytes to um, which is out of 1,000 total terabytes to use of heating and cooling in New York. Right now, though, renewable heating and cooling, which I guess I should have said is air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, solar thermal, uh, and biomass represents, you know, a very small portion uh, of the existing systems in New York, um, and even a small portion of what's sort of currently cost effective, right? Um, and so, you know, that's about 41 terabytes to use, about 4% of the state's load at current market conditions um, could be met cost effectively with renewable heating and cooling. So we've got to do a lot in our group to, to address this. So we're looking at, at cost reductions, uh, which have to be pretty deep, actually. Uh, and we're looking at, at bringing, bringing the, there's a lot of value that's created um, with these systems. There's value in the grid, there's value in terms of carbon reduction and near carbon goals. Uh, and one of the things that's not happening now is that value is not actually getting to, people, to the people who are investing in the systems. And so over the next five to 10 years, that's a big thing that we're going to be focused on, is trying to get that value back to the people who are paying for these things. Um, so I'm going to talk you know, as quickly as I can about a few of our sort of mid, you know, near, near, near mid and long term strategies. Um, we, we, one of the regulatory things we have to do here is put an investment plan together that lays out what we want to spend and how we want to spend it. Um, and that was the first, first step for us. And we just uh, last month got two investment plans uh, approved for about $6 million, $60 million, excuse me, uh, over five years. Um, and some of those initiatives, and I'll talk about each one a little bit more in a minute. Uh, we, have, we have a couple of, re of, of incentive programs. We're going to do something on community renewable heating and cooling. We're working with LEMPA on campus geo, and we're doing a, and we're doing a drilling cost reduction challenge. Um, if you wanted to see the investment plans, all of our investment plans are, are at that uh, uh, URL, which is NYSERDA about and under Clean Energy Fund. So uh, I'll, I'll spend just a couple minutes uh, or a minute maybe on each of these. Uh, I think Jens mentioned this in this slide. We have a ground source heat pump rebate that we launched uh, about a month ago. Uh, it provides uh, rebates for large, small scale and large scale ground source heat pump systems. See the funding amounts here. Uh, all sites have to pay the, the electric SPC, um, and the rebates actually paid to qualified designers or installers. Uh, at last I checked, we had close to 30 uh, approved designers and installers, and we're trying to get that number uh, up higher every day. Uh, I know that there's at least two or three of them, you know, uh, and uh, we've got about 20 or 30 applications in the door already. Uh, the total budget for this is $15 million over the next two years. Um, and it's not, the, it's not it's certainly not all we intend to do for ground source heat pumps, but it's something that hopefully spur things or keep things moving in the meantime. Um, so we're also this is not actually out on the street yet, but it will be um, you know, hopefully by the end of this month or the more next month. Um, we're putting some uh, money on the table for air source heat pumps. Uh, this is actually going to be provided to uh, distributors or installers directly, uh, and it's a five hundred dollar incentive. The heat pumps have to be on that NEEP list that Bruce uh, mentioned, that, that cold climate air source heat pump list. Um, again, it's got to be people who uh, pay into the SPC. Um, and actually, I didn't say this about ground source heat pumps. It's true there, too, but we're targeting uh, the customers where this makes financial sense in the near term, which is basically everybody competes with anything but gas, nat uh, natural gas, so, uh, so propane, electric, and, and oil. Um, and uh, that'll be out on the street. Um, in a, month, in a month or so. Um, this is something that we're really excited about. Um, we're actually working, we've identified that campuses, uh, college campuses and state buildings 
are actually amongst all the sectors a pretty good fit for where we're leading the pool right now. Um, and so we're collaborating with NIPA. Uh, this isn't something that's been formally announced yet or it's not something that people can participate in, but uh, we're going to screen a bunch of the state's colleges for the best fits for ground source heat pumps. Um, then we're going to provide some funding to do design assistance uh, up to about $125,000 for, for each of the campuses that's selected. Um, and then NIPA, who we're partnering with on this initiative, is going to provide up to $100 million worth of uh, low-cost financing. Their financing is a little less than a, a percentage point um, to, to finance the projects. So hopefully that will be a, a pretty exciting uh, endeavor. Um, and actually, I, so with me here is Rachel Genzer uh, from our group. Um, she's been working with me on um, putting together a community renewable heating and cooling program, which we need a better name for. So if anybody has good ideas on a name, um, she's going to just take one minute or two minutes to talk about that. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so Scott and I have been working on community renewable heating and cooling, um, thinking about thermalize. It's very similar to the solarized concept. Um, so it's a community procurement program. It's designed to promote the application of renewable heating and cooling technologies like biomass, solar thermal, um, ground and air source heat pumps. And yeah, those two. Okay. And um, in single family homes and small businesses. So a big part of this is that um, it's going to reduce costs for installers um, because a huge cost of um, oh, small. Okay. A cost for installers is. Um, drill mobilization. So moving the drill from location to location, if it's within um, a community, we're trying to do these community campaigns, um, that would reduce costs for the installers and allow them to experience the economies of scale. Um, it's based on a very successful county level renewable heating and cooling campaign in Tompkins County. It's Mark Tompkins, which you may be familiar with. Um, okay. So Nextert is going to provide direct financial support um, approximately a million dollars we have set up for three to five communities and they're going to launch multi-year campaigns to um, select for the community to select qualified installers and negotiate a reduced price for campaign enrollees. Um, we're also going to assist communities in working with local banks to develop financing offers um, for community campaign participants and universities to staff campaigns, volunteer, that sort of thing. Um, and develop the local workforce, um, engage university staff and faculty as campaign enrollees. Um, the program includes also, um, we're going to do pilot strategies for low to moderate income um, people um, to, improve, to increase that participation in um, the campaign. It's going to be an award of about $300,000. And um, from the proposals that we receive from these communities, we're going to select which community has the best idea for LMI incentives. And um, that's our community campaign. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Yeah. So I can't say enough about uh, Brian and Jonathan and the entire Heat Smart uh, board um, and participants. They've been very helpful. One of the things that we do at NYSERDA is collect up uh, and then sort of support, foster, and measure good ideas. Um, and uh, we were really excited and have been really excited about Heat Smart, and we're going to hopefully you know, help do a little more of that in Tompkins County and, and make it happen also in other communities around the state. So, Jonathan and Brian, thank you so much for, for your support. So, I think this is my, my last slide, um, and it talks about our, our longer term strategies. So, what can we, you know, obviously we're doing a little bit in ground source, a little bit in air, air source in the near term, but what do we really have to do to make the sea change that we need in real heating and cooling? And, and a few things that we think could be possible. Uh, as you probably know, we have a, a lead by example thing where the governor has said all state buildings are going to uh, procure some renewable energy, they're going to hit a certain uh, energy efficiency target. Um, what we could do is say, you know, all state buildings that can cost effectively do air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps have to. So that's something that could happen and something that we uh, are talking with our colleagues about a lot. Um, we have a stretch code, uh, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically like a volunteer code that. Um, is a step or two ahead of the actual existing uh, energy code in the state. Um, right now, that code, that stretch code uh, that's available includes some renewable heating and cooling elements for you know, giving people credit for solar thermal and ground source heat pumps. Um, we'd like to see that stretch code go even further, maybe do some of the things that Europe has done and said, and say, as a stretch code, we're going to eliminate all fossil fuel heating uh, in, our, in our area. Right? 
And so the way stretch code works is we help to develop it and then communities adopt it on a local level. And the cool thing about that is if we get enough communities that are adopting that stretch code, it makes it a lot easier for us to make it the state code um, you know, at, at a later date. Um, I mentioned earlier we have these carbon reduction goals. We also have some sort of energy efficiency goals. Um, and I think we have a goal that says we're going to reduce the energy. We're going to improve the energy efficiency of the building stock by like 27%, which relates to air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. But what we, we think would be really great and we've been advocating for in our group is a specific renewable heat cooling goal. Um, I think it would be similar to, again, a couple of things that Jens mentioned where we would say, you know, we're going to get 50% of our buildings in New York using renewable heating and cooling by 2025 or by 2030. And hopefully that is, that's something you'll hear more about as, as we, you know, achieve success in, in, in selling that idea uh, to the rest of our colleagues in state government. You'll hear more about that in your years to come. Um, and then, you know, we've got these sort of small amounts of incentives that we've put on the table. Uh, and these are really, it's an attempt to, in all these cases to get the value back to the people who are making the investments that I mentioned. And here are the, oh, some places where we're talking about ways, mechanisms, places we can get that value back. We can work, um, reform electricity rates, right, so that so that, that value to the grid is, is paid directly back to customers who install heat pumps. Um, there's something called the Clean Energy Standard, which is actually sort of the major funding source for large-scale renewables in New York. That standard, especially if we were to put this renewable heating and cooling goal in place, could be another mechanism where we could, through thermal renewable energy credits, bring money back to property developers. That would be primarily to, to, to account for the carbon value. Uh, of course, we have the Clean Energy Fund, which is where the $60 million investment that I have been talking about is coming from. Um, and then there's the utility energy efficiency programs. And you know, we're, there are a lot of, there are seven or eight utilities, there's only one that started, we'll, we're working with them as, as, as closely as we can. And there are several of them who are either already offering you know, incentives for renewable heating and cooling or are considering it, and we're doing our best to work with them as closely as we can. And hopefully we'll be in a situation where everything is pretty synergistic and people can use our incentive plus their incentive to, to get to a, a place where the systems are cost effective. So thank, thank you so much for, for So, uh, surprisingly, we do actually have time for some questions. I'd appreciate if they were concise, the questions and the answers are fairly concise. I know there are a number of people that had specific questions that they wanted to talk to people. There were presenters. If you don't have the opportunity to ask it during this period, uh, the, the presenters have committed to staying around for another half hour, 45 minutes to answer uh, you know, individual questions that people may have. So, all right, let's hear your questions. Uh, Ed? Yeah, for maybe Jen or Scott, um, there's been some talk of camp college campuses. Has there been any, any look at business parks? Because it seems like they have a lot of heating needs in lots of space in many cases, landscape space that could be used for geothermal. It seems like that would be another good place to focus uh, efforts. Has there been any thought of that? Um, I'll get to it's relatively simple. We're, we're conditioning a box. Whether that box is a house, a church, a business, whatever it is, it's, the technology is the same. Nowadays, you would put the same furnace or same heat plant in there. That's really, for us, there's no difference. This, I'm, I, we have a specific example. We have a major business park in the community. It's an area where there's a natural gas constraint yeah. and supply. So it seems like it would be a very logical way to really reduce gas demand on a number of buildings um, and there might be some efficiencies of putting geothermal in an area where you've got a bunch of buildings clustered together. It's, well, you know, you have to, it, it's not necessarily, you have to also be careful not to over-engineer it and nowadays we sometimes people talk about community loops and do everything and you know what? Sometimes it's so much more cheap to go a hole two feet from the building <laughs> and run a heat pump off. And we sometimes even do now schools and things like that, classrooms and schools just stretched out. Before we put all this entire infrastructure in the building, the central location and pumping it all through the building, one hole in front of the classroom, one heat pump on the classroom. <laughs> Next classroom, 30 feet down this way, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Do not go 
and invest into this whole infrastructure. We're trying to get the cost down. And the efficiency is not very different. That's where you get drilling efficiency, though, by doing multiples. Yeah, well, we need to place. drill multiples anyway. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, why do I need then to combine one loop field and serve multiple buildings and make, make this a giant loop field? Why can't I just put you know, 300 little loop fields up? Uh, the, the drilling costs are the same. Now I don't have to connect them. Now I don't have to pump it through all of them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it makes sense when you have a building where you know, who has a high solar gain on one side and a very uh, high still uh, heating need on the other side because it's a northern side. Then you share the same loop field. But a lot of times, it's very much, very easier just to provide one loop field for one loop for one zone. Let's give Scott a shot, shot at this. Yeah, so, so I, I, mean, I agree with everything that Jan said. I, I, I think. Um, a couple of ways that business parks are different than colleges, um, you know, that may make them, and I think they're a great, they're a great fit for sure. I mean, large scale systems, I think, are generally more cost effective than smaller scale systems. I think your point is, you know, even whether you're drilling a big loop or you're drilling <coughs> small loops, you do it all at one site all at one time, it's cheaper than doing two separate, and three hundred separate houses. Um, the thing that business parks don't have, two things that business parks typically don't have that colleges do that make them a better fit for, for, for what we need to right now is, College campuses typically have some sort of carbon, uh, carbon goal, carbon commitment that their residents have made. Um, you know, and that ma that makes them, you know, a little bit more interested in the carbon run, the extra carbon run. The other thing that, that college campuses have that business parks might or might not have, where you really get the benefit of the of, of the common loop if you decide to do one, is by having diverse loads. So if you ha if anybody hadn't seen it, I encourage you all to look at what Skidmore College has done up in up in Saratoga. They actually have created these nodes, right, that are three or four buildings each, and they have some uh, sort of academic space, which is really sort of day daytime prevalent uh, load, and then they also have a residential space like dorms, and they put those on the same loop field and actually load balance themselves. So that they've got they've, they've been able to get like a 30% reduction in the size of the loop field because of the load balancing. So that's that, you know that's a really cool sort of thing that's pretty you know uh, unique to college campus. So we've done, we've done, we've never done a whole business park, but we have done individual businesses. Now, one of them is, is actually the distribution center for the outdoor football in the ovens. And they built a new one, and guess what, they put tea on that. Uh, so they... Um, That's like a few other people. Lou has a question. Well, I wanted to say we're, we're designing a, uh, a system with Scott and I sure as hell in Syracuse that has one uh, loop system for six houses and a laundromat. And it'll be very well instrumented, so we'll get some uh, data out of that. Yeah, yeah I, I sh I, I'm not going to spend time, too much time talking about it, but I should mention that's another thing that we're doing with, with, with Lou's firm and with, with Bruce, is we're, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of performance testing on renewable heating cooling systems right now around the state. We're doing 40 mile island uh, sites, we've got a few different sort of large scale of ge uh, geo sites upstate, and then we're doing uh, about 50 air source heat pumps as well. So we'll have that data available for you. Martha? Yes, uh, I was in another meeting and apologize for missing so this was something you covered before the Scott. Um, the renewable, uh, community renewable heating and cool grants uh, based on our own pro project, that's terrific. Uh, are we eligible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, the we're, air we're, source we're hoping that you'll submit proposals. <laughs> okay, great. The Air Source Heat Pump uh, program, the new program, that's great to see, but you said it was not targeted to replacement of, of current gas heating. Why is that, and can we change that? So, I, I want to be clear, a couple, couple things I want to be clear of. One, I'm, I'm not working on that day-to-day -day enough to be confident about all of these answers I'm about to give you, just to preface it that way. Um, I'd love to be able to answer. I'm an engineer, too, so whenever I get away with it, I answer the way Bruce does. It depends. Uh, it's hard to do for me, but um, so I, I don't think it's going to say, I don't think we're saying you can't do it if you have gas. I think we're just saying that we're targeting it at customers that are oil and propane because that's where the better economics are. Um, I'm actually working on it. Uh, there's demonstration projects in Brooklyn and Queen, a demonstration pro project in Brooklyn and Queens for air source heat pumps in. We've got three or four sites in right now. One of them actually has negative savings, negative overall annual energy cost savings. Um, because they're replacing gas. That's how cheap gas is. And so, you know, we definitely don't want to overly encourage those things at this stage of the game, although eventually gas is going to come up in price. It's going to make more sense. 
Well, okay, just a just quick comment, and this relates to Ed's question about the business part. We have an additional uh, reason to make those replacements because we're on a tipping point about whether to whether NYSEG is going to put in an $18 million gas pipeline. So if to the degree that we can reduce load for gas, we can avoid the need for that pipeline. So that's a different consideration. And I hope you'll add that into the mix. Yeah, it definitely is in the mix um, you know, for, for us. I, I just didn't get a chance to mention it. Jen did a good job of talking about the Plattsburgh example. Um, it, you know, we're very uh, sort of um, encouraged by what's going on in Tompkins County related to gas expansion in my group um, specifically. Uh, and we want to, you know, we'd love to get to a point where, what well, we did a good job as a state to say in the electric grid, if you're going to make a big capital investment in infrastructure, let's look at demand side resources first before we make that infrastructure investment. We'd like to get our group, and I'm just speaking specifically about the renewable heat and cooling movement, <coughs> I, sir, I don't speak more pro broadly than that. But, you know, we would love to see a situation where we're, we're thinking the same way about gas infrastructure that, you know, let's look at the alternatives before making, you know, that kind of investment. Andrew and then Bob. <coughs> Given the fact that the Northeast has an enormous uh, amount of homes that are heated with perennial baseboard, is there an economic application of grass which can kind of tied into that existing delivery system? You're specifically asking about grass source? Yes. Um, you mentioned the ability to use some. We're talking about hot water baseboard? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have new um, high temperature heat pumps out there on the market. Um, they are, there's only one manufacturer who makes them, it's water furnace. Um, and uh, they, they send out 150 degree uh, water for that. Um, that is, you know, they lose their efficiency, like every heat pump is when the distribution temperature is getting too high. But it's relatively speaking, they still run at a COP of two and a half to three at that, that stage. And the point is, what you do is, you combine them with what we call an outdoor reset. That's very important to do. Meaning, you measure the outdoor temperature, and you only let the heat pump make as the water as hot as you need it for that day or for that moment. So most of the time, it actually runs much more efficient by only putting 120 or 130 degrees through it, but it goes up to 150. I yet have to see a single house where that wasn't enough to heat the house. Bruce? I just wanted to add, there's also a, a real promising technology that's being studied uh, by some of our colleagues in the Northwest right now, um, which is a, an air to water heat pump that uses a carbon dioxide refrigerant instead of the more conventional refrigerants. It operates at a much higher pressure, but it gives you uh, COPs uh, higher than two and delivered uh, hot water temperatures of 160, 165 degrees, even at minus 15 outdoor temperatures. So their overall annual efficiencies are very high, um, you know, even in Idaho in the mountains, and it, it looks very promising o over time as a, as a replacement for uh, boiler heated houses, um, use, you know, the use of oil or, or propane boiler. So that's not quite in the mainstream yet. You can't just go out and buy one of these things. Um, and I only know of one manufacturer, Sandan, that is making them now, but I think that is going to be coming over the next five to ten years um, and will be, you know, very affordable because you're not going to need to put in a, a ground connection. Yeah. I, know Brian, I know Brian's hurrying us long, I just want to say one more thing. So, quick thing, quick translation of that, you can do it right now with ground source, but it's also not quite mainstream, it's a little farther from mainstream for air source, but I just got to mention, with Tatum, uh, again, we're doing five, we're doing dem a demonstration project with five sites in Tompkins County of air source to hot water systems. Um, and if any of you are interested in being a demonstration site, I believe Lou's still looking for demonstration sites. I think um, we are, we're getting close. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we'll have performance data on how to do that effectively, uh, hopefully in the future. Uh, a, a comment and a follow-up question. We, we have one of those water furnaces uh, with the uh, baseboard heating in our house. It's an 1890s farmhouse that we retrofitted a couple of years ago, and it's, it's working at a, a COP of 3.6 in our actual usage after, after three winters. So it definitely works. But my question is a follow up on what Martha was saying in terms of, of the natural gas issue here. And your presentations were all great, but you were focusing on energy use, energy efficiency, costs, et cetera. If we actually take it back to the greenhouse gas footprint, natural gas has a larger greenhouse gas footprint than any of these other fuels. 
you know, again show that the CO2 emissions of the state have gone down. Total greenhouse gas emissions over the last half dozen years in New York have gone up because we're taking fracked shale gas from Pennsylvania with high, high methane emissions. So I think we really need to focus on getting rid of natural gas, even though it's a cheap fuel, if we're serious about the, the greenhouse gas emissions. And let me make one other uh, follow-on. We, we live, Roxanne and I live in a carbon neutral house. We drive an electric car, we have PV, we get the water furnace and all. Uh, but the first thing we did, going back seven years ago, was to replace our hot water system, domestic hot water, for showers and for uh, our laundry, et cetera, and we put in a uh, air source heat pump in the basement for that. It cost us $3,000 back then because you, know, you could do it for 2000 now. Prices have come down. But most homes in New York make their domestic hot water with natural gas. And for a home that has a one of those in-basement natural gas heaters, uh, roughly 35% of the total greenhouse gas footprint of the house is going into that domestic hot water. So for a cost of two to three thousand dollars per home, we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the state very, very quickly. Very, very. It's the most cost-effective way to go. And I just I published a paper on it a year ago in a peer-reviewed journal, and I brought a handout here for for people who are interested. I, I would add that if, if someone has an oil boiler with a with a tankless coil water heater, that replacing the boiler with a heat pump and the tankless coil water heater with a heat pump water heater is going to be even more dramatic. Yeah, because, that's, a, that's what we had actually. Those, those conventional water heating technologies are very, very low efficiency as well as being uh, using a, a, a carbon producing fuel on site. Right. Okay, one more question, then we're going to go to Nelson. Fernando? Well, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but just uh, it seems like the technologies are there, they're mature, some newer ones are coming, they're going to be great. Uh, what I, I, I'm, I'm concerned here, we have so many, uh, they're retrofitting existing housing, I think it's, it's particularly a, a challenge. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, I'd like to hear more about the money. It's, it's all about the money. Uh, a homeowner needs, you know, maybe a five or six year return on investment, not 20, 30 years, which, you know, is what I'm hearing when I get, I've been evaluated and all that, and it's never worked out. Uh, so just just putting that comment out there, you know, at some point we need to bring it down uh, so that, you know, me as a homeowner can fix my house and see the returns while I'm, while I'm still living. Well, I, I, I tell you, i give you an example. It's, it's, uh, you know, free energy is tough to make it free. Uh, and uh, um, the, the problem there is, if we go out there and we replace a gas furnace, it takes four hours. In, out, this, that. If we put a geo system in, it's 200 hours of highly skilled labor to do that. Uh, and uh, so the question is, what, what's the payback? And right. in the cases of oil, propane, this, that, geez, that's, that's simple. Uh, the technology is there, the technology is mature. Uh, you know, in every application, that's what I'm saying, it's a box, the condition. Um, so, but, you know, and we're, we're getting the cost down uh, in terms of higher production rates. I mean, if I can go in and we drill a whole neighborhood, and I don't have to go back to the, the, the rig for every single house, it takes some, some, some guts to do that from a building perspective. I have a builder which built a, a whole green neighborhood with 27 homes. And he put one purchase order in after another because he wasn't sure how many people up for geo. Well, at the end, three years later, 26 out of 27 went geo. Jeez, we could have done the whole thing much cheaper. If he would have had the guts to say, you know, you one guy, go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, I sell that house three weeks later to somebody else. Move on the whole problem would have been solved. And we can get the cost down, and we can have standardization of this is, is very simple. Uh, you know, we don't have to re-engineer the, the systems. The houses are between two and 23, 2400 square foot. Um, you know, it's the same size heat pump we put in there. A variable speed, you let it run, and whether it runs at stage six or seven, doesn't matter. Uh, that's, that's where the savings are standardization of those elements. Um, and, but it takes some willingness, you know, if we make this whole thing, um, as, as I always give you as a comparison, if we would have 
remember when we just realized we have to put catalytic converters into cars and we didn't really ask how much the payback is? Because <laughs> there was no payback, payback, it was more expensive. But we realized there's something we gotta do. Imagine where we would be without it today. And we're paying a price, and the price is not the dollar anymore. If it, I don't know who, who of you have been in China lately, but they shut down in the northern provinces towns, airports, schools, everything. They couldn't even fly into it anymore because of the smog. Can you imagine what economically that does? They're not stop, stop burning the coal there because it's cheaper to do something else. They're stopping it because they pay a price economically on the emissions. Because they pushed it too far.